Okay, good afternoon. Thank you for joining us. This is the VCE Loudon Master Gardener online classes. My name is Barbara Bailey. I'm the Community Engagement Coordinator in charge of the Master Gardeners. And today's session, which is very well attended, is on summer vegetables and the planting information. So some housekeeping, we'll be taking questions at the end. You will see a chat box. You should see that down at the bottom of your screen in a toolbox. It says chat with a little cartoon box in it. So uh, if you pop on that, you'll be able to type a question. We'll take questions at the end of the session. So once again, I'd like to introduce Denise Palmer. She's a Master Gardener from the class of 2005. Her major interest, as far as I know, is uh, and her knowledge lies with vegetable production. She's a former a leader of the demonstration garden out at Ida Lee for the Master Gardeners, a garden to table team lead, and she was also a past president of the Round County Master Gardener Association. So Denise Palmer, thank you, and it's all yours. <laughs> well, thank you all for uh, joining us today. Um, you know, the weather is warm today, but I they tell me that it's gonna cool down again, but this was a perfect time to to talk about summer vegetables and some of the things that we want to be aware of, especially if you haven't um, purchased your plants or, or uh, maybe you're looking around at the nurseries or the home improved stores about, well, what, did, what exactly am I going to grow this year as far as summer vegetables? Um, since so I don't forget, I have a web resource from VCE. Um, and this is a good one to, to highlight. Um, we'll probably go, since this is basically a one-way conversation, <laughs> you may uh, find yourself with uh, some questions. Um, and VCE has a really good beginner website, uh, especially for the beginning of new gardeners um, to go to. And so you can jot that down or you can Google uh, VCE Home Vegetable Gardening and it should take you to this link right there, but it has a lot of excellent resources uh, should you have uh, further questions or need more in-depth knowledge. So what are, we, what are we talking about when we talk about um, summer vegetables? So here in Virginia, uh, our season isn't that long. And so when we talk summer vegetables, uh, some of our vegetables really need to go in as transplants. And here, all our tomatoes and peppers and eggplants, they'll all go in as transplants. Um, there's simply not enough uh, time in the season for us to plant, let's say, a tomato seed and get that tomato. Um, certainly it'll grow, it'll get some leaves, um, it may even get some fruit on it, but not enough time to get them to harvest. So when we're talking tomatoes, peppers, and eggplants, we really need to buy those as transplants, which means you need to start them at home um, earlier in the year, or you're going to need to secure those from a home improvement store or a nursery. Uh, we also talk about um, different kinds of seeds. So when you're reading a plant tag, when you're, when you're looking at these transplants or even a, a seed package, um, sometimes we have questions about what is an open pollinated seed. And an open pollinated seed is just one of those seeds where the variety has been passed on from year to year because you're saving seeds. So open pollinated seeds, they can be planted and they can be harvested. Um, and you save your best fruits for those seeds that you want to save to the next year. Um, seed saving tests can vary from vegetable to vegetable. So it's really one of those things you kind of need to get some more information online about before you save seeds. But uh, your best vegetables really should be uh, the vegetables um, that you're saving seeds from when it comes to open pollinators. We hear a lot about the heirloom seeds, especially the heirloom tomatoes. Uh, if you go to the farmer's markets, oftentimes our heirloom tomatoes are being, um, they're being uh, out center in front and they're showcasing them. Um, and people go, you know, oogle them and ah, and, and I have to say that heirloom tomatoes can be some of the best tasting tomatoes, but they also can be uh, somewhat difficult um, to grow as well. Um, because they're not hybrids. Uh, so heirloom seeds as a seed are older, old, open pollinated. So they're open pollinated seeds. They've just been around for a really, really long time. And the reason why they've probably been around for a long time is because um, they've de developed or grew into some resistance to either pests 
or disease or maybe even weather. You know, there might be a variety which does very well here because it got used to our hot, humid summers. Um, Southern Exposure Seed Exchange is one of those seed companies online. They're in Mineral, Virginia, and they tend to have a lot of varieties which do well here because they're using open pollinated seeds and they're saving those seeds. And the seeds are, are doing very well here. So that's just an example of a seed company that's saving seeds from, from plants which may do well in this area. Although I'm told online there's not many seeds left. So I'm not sure that they have anything left anymore. Hybrid seeds are quite a different thing. And a lot of people get hybrids um, confused with GMOs. Hybrids are not GMOs. And for the home garden, you cannot purchase uh, genetically modified uh, organism seeds. Uh, we can purchase hybrid seeds though. And hybrid seeds are a cross between two different varieties. Let's say two different tomatoes. They've sort of uh, put those together to make a tomato, which may have um, better resistance to some kind of pest, or it may have better resistance to some kind of disease. And especially if you're an organic gardener, um, hybrids really do have a place in the garden because if you have a, if you have a plant that um, is resistant to maybe some pest or tolerant of a pest or a disease, you may not have to use insecticides or pesticides. Um, on that plant. So that sort of saves you down the road. Um, and hybrid seeds are often resistant, especially in the tomato and pepper. Um, they're often resistant to a number of, of uh, diseases which can really decimate. So if you look at your plant tag, when you're looking at uh, hybrids, uh, such as a tomato or a pepper or even an eggplant, um, it's gonna have a bunch of different uh, uh, letters on it. Um, and if you look up those letters online, if you just got your phone, you look them up, it, it will tell you what particular diseases that that particular plant is tolerant or resistant to. Um, with a hybrid seed though, you can't save your seeds. Well, you can save them. Um, but when you save them and try to plant them the next year, they're not going to come back as the same vegetable. They, you may get a tomato plant, but that tomato plant is usually not going to be what you had. Instead, it's going to revert back to its parent. And sometimes its parent wasn't very tasty. I will tell you that now. Um, of course, we're master gardeners. We've, we've done it before just to see what would happen. And the tomatoes usually are pretty awful. So when you do have a hybrid, just remember you can't save the seeds. They won't come back true the next year. But with our heirloom varieties and our open pollinated, you can save those seeds um, and uh, go next year with them. So when we're talking about um, going to our first, our first sort of summer vegetable. So we'll go into beans. So we're going to sort of step through these alphabetically. So on beans, we can have pole beans or we can have bush beans. Now, bush beans are, they're going to take up a lot of space because they're exactly that, they're bush. So if you're a small space gardener, you may find that bush beans take up too much space in, in your garden. And you may choose to plant instead pole beans. Now, pole beans um, grow up, grow up uh, poles, uh, they can grow up fences, um, but they can grow very, very tall. They can, sometimes they can grow uh, 15, uh, 18 foot tall, those vines. I usually put up a teepee. I don't have a lot of space. And so generally, um, I put up a teepee uh, using bamboo poles, using eight foot bamboo poles and allow my beans to grow up um, a teepee. Um, it takes up much less space than if I were to uh, plant out bush beans. When we're talking beans though, and this really is gonna go for any of the summer vegetables. We really need to make sure our soil is warm enough. Now approaching May here at the end of the week and some of you may be panicking because you think that you it's just too late for you to plant a summer garden but I want to assure you that planting a summer garden um, after Mother's Day isn't our summer garden. Now if your summer garden uh, you've already got it in I want to warn you to make sure that you are uh, watching the weather because if things get too cold you're going to need to protect those plants that you have out there. 
Um, and I'm to understand that the weather is going to turn uh, more season unseasonably cool next week. So you might be want to be watching that if you're planting your summer vegetables or have them in the garden already. With beans, we want to make sure that our soil is warm enough because what will happen with bean seed if the soil is cool and wet, and can we say it has rained a lot? <laughs> um, the be the seeds will just rot in the soil. So we we do want our soil to warm up just a little bit more and we want that soil to dry out just a little bit more otherwise we could have the potential to see bean seeds hot. I've listed off some snap bean varieties um, to grow. These are some of the most popular and probably you know those that have the fortitude. You know we know it's wet now we don't know what summer brings but these varieties that I've listed um, they're pretty tried and true. They're varieties that um, tend to do well um, in any weather, whether it's too wet or too uh, dry. Um, and uh, some of them are heirloom uh, bean varieties. Uh, so you may be able to keep the seeds next year. Uh, most of these are just the snap bean varieties. I didn't list like the limas and, and some of the other beans, which take longer. Um, online, you can find more information about them. Um, when we are growing our beans, we want to make sure that we're removing any weeds around our beans as they grow up because weeds will bring in insects and insects which come in may be snacking on our beans, our little seedlings in the ground. So we wanna make sure that our, we've removed the weeds around where we'll be planting our beans. Uh, in this area, people tend to have a, a huge problem with the Mexican bean beetle uh, especially with our pole beans. If you're a pole bean grower and you know you've had problems with the Mexican bean beetle, this year you might want, if you have the space, you might want to try bush beans. Um, bush beans can be row covered. You can put row cover over them. They don't need to be pollinated. Um, and you could ex ex uh, make it so that the Mexican bean beetle doesn't get to your beans once they're grown up. Um, also, another thing we like to do uh, to, in a sustainable vegetable garden is plant a trough crop. So if you Mexican bean beetles are an issue, um, I would suggest uh, planting what we call a trap crop of bush beans two weeks before we put our main crop in. And the reason for it is the bush beans are going to become a trap for all those insects we don't much like. And then once that trap crop is infested, we're going to actually pull that trap crop out and dispose of it far away from our garden. So the intent is to draw the bad insects to a crop we really don't care about. Also, um, in order to mitigate some of the pest issues, plant a lot of small flowered companion plants around the perimeter of your garden. Now, if our seedlings are die or stunted, we may have nematodes in the soil. Um, and then when we get to pests and such, I've got some some uh, uh, things listed down there for the past. But right now we're just gonna concentrate on the actual uh, planting and getting them in. But you can see as you look through the slide there, some of the things that you can do. A lot of people have uh, as, as problems with Mexican bean beetles. And so they have a tendency not to, not to grow them because you know, there doesn't seem to be much you can do once that uh, Mexican bean beetle is Um, but I know there are some options for giving. Next, we're going to move on to um, the cucumbers. And I'm going to go ahead and I'm just going to go with name. I see my internet connection is unstable. So I'm going to go ahead and stop my video. I'll still be here. I have to find, oh, there we go. Um, so on our cucumbers, we have, uh, if you've been around gardening for a little while, you know that got different gardeners um, grow different kinds of cucumbers. And if you've ever seen the cucumber plant, which grows up the fence and it's kind of curly, um, it's really an Armenian cucumber. And it, they call it a, a snake cucumber. But that cucumber, although it tastes like a cucumber, is not actually a cucumber, it's actually a melon. So when we're, oh, gotta get my slide back. 
Um, so generally these are long and thin in diameter. They have a lightish green. Um, they're crunchy. Uh, they don't require peeling or seeding when you eat them. And the good thing about the Armenian cucumber is they have a very long vine and they tolerate very hot conditions and they tolerate very poor soils. Um, however, the hotter it is, the faster they grow. So in order to get a useful cucumber out of this, you have to harvest them and be ready to harvest them uh, like every day. And this cucumber is not good for pickling. The English cucumbers, um, you could also be planting these. These are seedless and they're the kind that you find in the grocery store, which are all wrapped in plastic. Um, they're long and thin. They have a very mild flavor and they're considered a herbless variety. So cucumbers, uh, when you're reading through descriptions of cucumbers, sometimes they say they're burpless or bitter or bitter or non-bitter. Burpless just generally means um, it's a non-bitter variety, which means it's probably a newer variety. Um, English cucumbers are not good for pickling. So if you're planting and you're a pickler, you really need to uh, pick a cucumber, which is, which is meant for pickling because they have a harder flesh. Next, we have the garden cucumbers. So the garden cucumbers are what most of us are gonna grow. It's the most common cucumber grown here. Um, within that, within that uh, title, we have slicing, we have pickling, we have specialty cucumbers, like the lemon cucumber. And we also have varieties that are meant for containers, which means that they're not gonna vine out and they're gonna be bushier and they're gonna be smaller plants. So if you are a container gardener, uh, make sure that you pay attention to your seed packets because you're gonna want varieties um, which, are, which are smaller in diameter. And, um, and then lastly, we have cucumber terms for pollination because as we've, as we've moved on down the road uh, with cucumbers, we're finding a lot of new, new terms out there. And monosaceous um, has both male and female flower. It's the kind of old school cucumber that we're used to. The male flowers come out first along the vine to the side of the vine, and then the female flowers come. And the reason why the male goes first um, is because the female sort of waits to make sure the male is in there, and then the female flowers, and she usually has a little fruit at the end of her flowering, but it's to make sure that there are enough pollinators. So the male comes to sort of bring the pollinators in and then the female flowers. Um, and it could be two or three weeks later by time a female flowers. And a lot depends on weather, humidity, some other uh, environmental things. But then the female, when she comes out, she, good, the pollinators are here. She's ready to be pollinated. And then, you know, good things come from that, mainly cucumbers. Um, gynoaceous is a cucumber variety which only has female flowers but you have to plant a plant with male flowers now this is where if you're a small space gardener and you you bought one of these varieties that say it's gynoaceous um you have to be aware that within that seed packet it's mostly uh cucumbers with female flowers but they do have um seeds with male flowers so in essence you really have to plant the whole packet in order to get pollination. So as a small space gardener, I would stay away from the gynoaceous um, type cucumbers unless um, you can plant out the whole packet. And then Parthenocarpic don't need to be pollinated. These are the kind of cucumbers a lot of times we're using out in our demonstration garden. Um, if you go out in midsummer, you may see row cover, uh, on a trellis where they have row covered the entire um, cucumber population or, or all the cucumber plants. And they've done that um, because these cucumbers don't need to be pollinated by bees or other insects. And so they can be row covered and that gives them the advantage over disease um, and pests, which um, may come and actually kill your cucumbers. So those are just some terms to keep in mind for cucumbers. Um, when you're reading the seed packet, uh, it will probably tell you if it says nothing, then assume it has, the cucumber has both male and female flowers on it.
in the cucumber realm, uh, we, what we want to look for, if, you, if you're having problems with disease in your cucumbers, or your cucumbers seem to go down earlier than you think they should go down, um, these are some resistant varieties um, in the cucumbers, uh, Liberty and Diva. I have grown both of those because I've had a, a fairly uh, big problem with cucumber beetles. Uh, I started growing these um, because they're more uh, wilt resistant and they're the burpless varieties. Uh, burpless cucumbers are more resistant to our cucumber beetles than our regular varieties. So there's just a, a couple there. I've also grown the County Fair um, and the Improved Green Long. Um, all, all four of them have done fairly well. And uh, I no longer have cucumber beetle problems. Not sure why, but uh, maybe it's because I grew varieties and the cucumber beetles um, took off and went someplace else over the years. If you do have insect or disease issues, um, plant a trap trap crop of cucumbers first. Again, we're going back to that trap crop. If we know the insects are coming, then let's plan for that. So in a sustainable garden, we, we always want to plan that, you know, how are we going to manage? We know the insects are coming. And of course, uh, picking a resistant variety is a good thing, but also thinking, hey, let me get a trap crop of cucumbers in. That'll take, uh, that'll attract those uh, pests to the plant and then I can get my main crop in. Um, you can see I've got trap crop, the Cacazzelli summer squash. Uh, cucumber beetles love it. Um, last year, I actually um, planted uh, in the squash area, I actually planted blue hovered squash, knowing it would never come to fruition um, as a trap for squash beetles. And it did a, a wonderful job of attracting the, squ the squash bugs um, and keeping them away from my squash and cucumber. Uh, the thing with cucumbers, you get them in, the soil's warm enough, those little plants come popping up through that soil, and then you go back like a day later and you see that your plants have all been eaten up. That's what a cucumber beetle, as soon as you plant, it's like game on for them. They are, uh, they are waiting for those plants to pop up. Um, so if you are planting out in the soil, the best thing to do is to place some row cover over it so that the cucumber beetles can't get it. Now, I used to say, you know, if the soil was warm enough, your cucumber would pop up in about three days, and they will. Uh, but more and more, they're saying that um, you should start your cucumbers indoors um, a couple weeks before you intend to plant them, and then put them out when they have uh, two or three sets of leaves, that the cucumber beetles aren't so much attracted to them anymore when they're small. So again, that's sort of a, something you can do to, to mitigate um, the insect issues um, is to start indoors a couple weeks, get a couple sets of leaves on them, and then transplant them out to the garden. Now, whenever we're transplanting something to the garden that we've grown, we always need to make sure that we harden it off before we put it in our garden. So if you put it in first, you got to know and think, oh, this isn't ready for the outdoors. So hardening off is, is something you should investigate on how and how to do it um, to get it used to the outdoors so that you can get it into your garden and going. And then it, once again, I've just uh, laid out some, some, uh, some other things for, uh, for pest controls and mitigating pests um, on down the line. Uh, with cucumbers, we always want to make sure that we keep our plant watered because cucumbers love water. Um, so keep the plant watered, don't keep the leaves watered though. We'll move on to summer and winter squash. Um, very important with squash crops to make sure that we're rotating our crops, that we're not growing the same family of vegetables in the same place year after year after year. And the reason being is that insects overwinter. So with squash, squash bugs and their larvae, they love to overwinter. So we're making sure that we're rotating our crops in the garden and we're cleaning up any old debris, old garden debris, get it away from the garden, put it in the household trash if it's bug infested or disease infested. With summer squash, uh, as with cucumbers, we like to plant them in hills. Um, and the reason why I plant them in hills is it gets them above the ground a little bit um, and it, the water 
when it comes, it sort of uh, concentrates at the base. So squash and cucumbers will have plenty of water. So if you plant it in a hill, uh, a good pest, pest control to plant icicle, radishes, onions, or nasturtiums around the hills. And again, this is a, this is a, uh, a pest um, uh, thing that we're doing. We're planting those around the hills, around our squash, and it's going to draw in beneficials. Now I will tell you, the icicle radishes are gonna bring in the bad bugs. So once those icicle radishes are infested with bugs, we're not eating them, it's a trap. Um, we are gonna pull those icicle radishes out and get them away from our garden. It's, it's done its mission, which is, isic which is to, to attract the bad insects. Onions has to do with aroma. Nothing's gonna be infested or infesting your onions. It's all gonna be about aromas and trying to disguise that we have this little squashy right here. And the nasturtium, they're going to attract bad bugs. So once again, once the nasturtiums are, uh, are infested with bugs, bad bugs, always know whether it's bad or good, um, then we're, we wanna pull it out and get it away from our squash. So I've got some um, varieties which are resistant. Uh, if you find squash bugs are, are uh, your issue. Um, I've got uh, early prolific and early summer. Um, the acorn obviously is a winter squash and the sweet cheese is obviously a winter squash. Uh, squash vine borers, if this is your issue, uh, you can see I've got um, those listed there. Um, and then if cucumber beetles are an issue, understand that cucumber beetles love zucchini type squash. So I love zucchini type squash. I, I'm a zucchini uh, type person um, and cucumber beetles are gonna be an issue. So uh, once again, when I plant blue Hubbard squash as a trap crop, um, oh, it was away from where I had my, uh, my uh, zucchini and cucumbers. Um, they were perfectly happy to go over there and hang out um, and leave my good stuff alone. And then when we're talking cucumber beetles, one of the issues that comes up is you say, well, cucumber beetles will eat, they'll eat on your leaves, but what they really do is they bring in wilt and they're bringing in disease. Most bad insects, we'll call them bad, that come into the summer garden. It's not just that they're there and that they might be snacking on our leaves, it's not that they're usually they're bringing viruses and diseases to our summer crops. And when they bring these viruses and diseases, they infect our crops. And then obviously our crops are gonna be, maybe they won't produce like they should, uh, and maybe they'll just flat out die. Uh, a measure, when I had cucumber beetles, one thing I used to do was I would, used to plant successively. I wouldn't plant all my cucumbers at one time. Instead, I'd say, okay, I know that cucumber's going down. So I'm gonna plant one cucumber hill now. I'll plant another one in two weeks and I'll plant another one two weeks after that. So I had successive plantings going on. Um, and with cucumbers and squash, you can do that, summer squash. You know, winter squash has a bit uh, longer uh, time it needs in order for maturity. Um, use a mulch uh, if you've gone out to the demonstration garden in the past, you know that we use silver um, mulch. It's called silver mulch. It's a plastic, um, but it does deter aphids. Um, and you can probably find out a little bit more about that online. Uh, row cover, can't say enough about row cover. Row cover is one of those things that you can get online. Um, you cover up your plant, so you are making it so nothing gets to your plant until you want it to. Now with squash, it's going to have to be uncovered when they start flowering um, because that those flower it needs to be pollinated and then some other uh, things regarding pests there so now we go in tomatoes which is really what uh, people even if you don't consider yourself a gardener it's really what <laughs> what you what you uh, like to grow even if it's just a you know a simple tomato to the side of your house but when we're talking tomatoes, we're actually talking um, two different varieties. And not varieties, uh, two different types. So our tomato varieties, uh, or I gotta say, stop saying varieties, two different types. We have what we call determinate tomatoes. 
Now, determinate tomatoes are compact, bushy type tomatoes. So if you're a container gardener, you're really looking, when you're looking at that plant tag, that's what you're looking for. You're looking for something that's determinate. It's gonna be compact, it's gonna be bushy, and it's gonna do really well in a container. Now, an in-ground gardener, you say, well, why, why would I want one of those? Well, if you're a canner, if you're a determinate type tomato, and most bromas are determinate type tomatoes. That's because you want all your tomatoes to come at once, because when you're canning, you don't wanna do onesies and twosies, because you can't really can. Instead, we want all of our tomatoes to pretty much ripen at the same time. And a determinate type of tomato will do that. Now, another good thing about a determinate tomato is they're not that large. They're not the large, gangly, you know, uh, grow 12, 15 foot vines. Um, they only get three to four foot in height. Uh, they produce over a very short period of time and then they're basically done. Um, and I listed some uh, common varieties there. Now our indeterminates, that's the, probably the picture you get in your head when you're talking tomatoes. You know, this, this huge thing, it's got vines all over, you know, your, the little circle cages, you know, it, they fall over like at the end of July because the tomatoes all, and those are called indeterminates. And they're a vining tomato. So your vines may grow 10 foot or more. And generally, they need extensive staking to keep them upright. Um, they may require some pruning. I, I mean, I prune mine, but you have to be a little bit careful with the pruning because you really don't want to prune too much because what the plant will do in response to pruning is try to put out more um, stems and leaves and green stuff. And at a certain point, what you want that um, plant doing is actually putting out tomatoes um, and ripening those tomatoes. So after a certain point, I'd be careful with the pruning, usually after mid-July, a little careful with the pruning because we really um, wanna get a lot of fruit production. But, you know, pruning it's, you know, 10, 15% uh, 10, is usually okay. Make sure we're giving them plenty of space. I can't say that enough. An indeterminate uh, tomato needs, um, it should be three foot on center um, from your next tomato. And say, well, why? And I know when you first put them in the ground, you're like, oh, I can do, I can do like, you know, like five per 10 square, uh, 10 foot row. But then they start growing. And then what, it, then what happens? And then they get too close together. And then we're, we're finding it almost impossible to keep them separated. And tomatoes want air. They want circulation. They don't like to be, they don't like to have wet leaves because it all promotes disease in our tomatoes. So make sure we're giving those tomatoes a lot, indeterminate tomatoes, a lot of room and giving them some, some room so they have some space so the air can get to them. Um, when if, if it's gonna be a wet summer, we want them to dry off before we touch them. Now, an indeterminate tomato is gonna produce tell frost if disease doesn't get it first. So, you know, indeterminate, it's gonna go till frost if the, if the plant is, is uh, hardy and hasn't been disease ridden. And indeterminate tomatoes include all the heirloom tomatoes and they include all the cherry tomatoes. Now, most of us are familiar with the cherry tomatoes, especially those who are older gardeners. You know, you've got the, uh, oh gosh, what's that yellow thing? I forget what that yellow, uh, man, I can't believe, I don't, I don't um, grow cherry tomatoes anymore. I used to. Um, but I just don't grow them anymore. But you've got, uh, you know, those cherry tomatoes, boy, it's just hard to kill them. Um, they just like tons of them um, grow. And it's great for new gardeners because it'll, it's kind of hard to kill them, and, but they'll grow on forever. Uh, some common known varieties um, in the indeterminates, we've got your better boy, which is gonna be a hybrid, your big beef. Uh, big beef does really well here. It's really a standard tomato. Um, it's a hybrid, our mortgage lifter, huge tomato, uh, and our brandy wine tomatoes, they're also huge tomatoes. And then our tomatoes, you know, we have different fruit sizes. You know, we have our standard uh, globe, you know, that sort of that uh, shape you find in the grocery store. We've got our cherry, we've got the huge beef steaks, and then we have plum and pear tomatoes. So, I mean, tomatoes come in so many varieties, um, I don't, I wouldn't even know where to begin. Um, uh, starting with all of them, but you know, those are basically where we, what we see in tomatoes. Let's see. And 
I'll be right back. I think my, you get froze up. There we go. So um, our top varieties tomatoes, just something for your information. Again, I put some of the top, oh, it's the super sweet 100s, the sun golds is what I was talking about. Um, the sun golds is what I'm talking about and the black cherries. Am I still here? Barb, am I still there? Yes, it just takes me a while to unmute. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I didn't know. I was like, am I still here? Because I'm not getting the boxes at the top of my uh, screen anymore. Um, so we have the sun gold cherries. Um, and then in our pace, we're generally uh, familiar with the Romas and the San Marzanos. And then, of course, our big tomatoes, you know, uh, the mortgage lifters, the big boys, um, container tomatoes. So when we're talking tomatoes again, uh, you know, choose a container tomato. And these are some of the, the popular uh, container tomatoes. The, the early girls, uh, there's a bush beefsteak. Um, I think there's even a bush big boy as well. There's a, each year they increase the kind of things that they're, uh, that they're making for containers. Uh, you know, 10, 15 years ago, when you were a container gardening boy, you just didn't have a lot of choice. But uh, more and more people are into container gardening uh, because they want smaller, they live in smaller spaces or they, they don't want to do a whole big in-ground garden. So if you need a container tomato, make sure that you're, you're looking at your um, plant tag to see what it is. Denise? Yeah. You need to reshare your presentation. Oh, okay. That's what I'll Yeah. You're cutting out a little bit too. Just reshare your screen. Yeah, I can't seem to get the um, the like box has disappeared. Let me go back here. Okay. Oh, your tool. Yeah. There you go. There we go. Okay. Okay. There we go. Okay, so um, when we're planting tomatoes, now again, a reminder that with our summer vegetables, we really want to be doing these after uh, Mother's Day. Uh, tomatoes are pretty good to go in after Mother's Day. Uh, if we're doing peppers, peppers really we should wait until the uh, soil is a little more warm in a couple of weeks. I don't think that we'll be doing peppers today because I see that we're probably going to run short on time. Um, and I know some of you have some questions. But with tomatoes, it is important that we rotate our crop. Uh, again, it's one of those uh, crops that we want to make sure we rotate because diseases and pests actually reside um, in the uh, soil where you grew them last year. And we want to make sure that the same diseases are not going to infect the tomatoes that we're growing this year. Uh, weeding around the garden is very important when planting outer tomatoes. Again, um, getting rid of any uh, last year's pests or last year's, um, last year's uh, diseases. Uh, we want to amend our soil with compost and we want to fertilize properly as well. Um, I know there's all, I mean, if you Google tomatoes and how to grow, there's all kinds of stuff out there. Um, just watch what, when you're Taking the advice of someone online, just make sure that you're careful with what you're uh, fertilizing your tomatoes with. We don't want to over fertilize. Generally, we don't want to over fertilize our summer vegetables. Uh, summer vegetables, which are over fertilized, will grow lots of green leaf, leafy stems, and they'll look gorgeous, but they may not produce much fruit. Um, so when we're talking fruit, we really don't want to over fertilize like if we were growing um, like green lettuce or what have you. Uh, we want to make sure we're using the appropriate fertilizer. So the fertilization fertilizer that you use, it should say on that is appropriate for vegetables. Um, and then remember to plant uh, disease resistant varieties. Uh, look on that plant tag. If you have a small space, uh, 
then you, you want to be more aware of planting um, resistant varieties um, because you're probably going to space them closer together than you should. Um, if you know that you're always going to have an issue, then um, pick a variety um, that has resistance to the particular issue that you have. Um, plant companion plants with your tomatoes. Um, and I like to plant buckwheat. So buckwheat is kind of a cover crop and you can only grow it during the summertime because um, it gets frosted and then it dies. But I like to plant it around my garden because it, it brings in beneficials. And beneficial insects are gonna kind of take care of some of my problem issues. So buckwheats, I think you probably have to buy it online. Um, I'm not sure if they might have it someplace. I think if you buy it at Southern States, you have to buy like a, a 50 pound bag or something. So if you're interested in that, that may be something you want to uh, research. On tomatoes, we also want to make sure that we mulch because we do not want the water splashing up on our fruits. So use an organic mulch um, like straw or dried grass, uh, shredded newspaper, uh, shredded uh, chopped leaves. Um, and then if you're adventurous, you, you plan for a living mulch, which is hairy vetch. And again, you can find more information about that online. But using organic mulches um, keeps, uh, keeps our leaves uh, dry uh, and keeps uh, our fruit dry and keeps um, diseases from splashing up on it. Now with mulches, make sure that you're keeping it away from the stem of the plant because you don't want your stem to rot out because you've got, um, you have material laid up against it. Um, we're watering our tomatoes evenly and deeply. We should not be watering our tomatoes every day. If we are, we're not promoting roots which go a long way. So make sure you're watering evenly and deeply um, to promote roots which will go down far into the soil instead of just staying at the top of the soil. So watering every day will just give us shallow roots anything where we won't have good roots to hold our plant upright um, when the thunderstorms come. And with tomatoes, we want to talk about um, caging and trellising. It's important that when we, uh, when we cage, uh, when we plant our tomatoes and we plant our peppers, um, that we uh, cage and trellis those things immediately. Um, Tomatoes, I don't care what kind you buy, unless it's only one that gets like two foot tight, it's gonna need some kind of caging or trellising. And there are different systems for doing that. Of course, if you go to the home improvement store, you notice they have the little, the little round ones. Don't even consider those for a tomato plant. Instead, consider those for pepper plants. Those pepper plants are fairly brittle and peppers will need to go in with some kind of trellising or staking as well. Instead, if uh, consider the large ones, but even the large ones on a tomato plant are probably going to topple uh, when it comes to end of July or in August. So make sure we're getting staking to go with it and we're driving stakes in. And we like to do this immediately when we plant so as that we're not damaging, uh, damaging the plant itself or damaging its root system. Um, Trellising for other vegetables. You know, vegetables that you can grow on a trellis, uh, cucumbers uh, will readily uh, scamper up a, a trellis. Squash, not so much. Um, squash uh, usually needs to be trained if it's a non-bush variety. Uh, watermelons, uh, watermelons and melons and gourds, if the fruit is smaller than a volleyball, you can certainly train it to grow up a trellis, but you might have to install some kind of thing to sort of hold the fruit. Uh, pole beans, get your teepee in as soon as you plant those pole beans. If you're doing poles, make your teepee immediately, then plant your beans around each leg of the teepee. And then of course, tomatoes, make sure that uh, we're getting it in, especially with the indeterminate or heirloom types, you're getting in caging and staking. Uh, on some, you may need to train the vines and then make sure your trellis is firmly anchored in the ground. I can't say this enough because I don't know how many trellises I've had fall over on me. So make sure we're getting that in the ground 
um, solid. So when that thunderstorm does come, when your plant is eight foot tall in that cage, it just didn't go like that. Um, uh, uh, so get those in and then fences. Uh, fences, keep out your critters. Uh, right With summer vegetables, it's not so much uh, that you have to keep out stuff. Uh, in the beginning, it, when the vegetables finally fruit, then you see we got your squirrels going after your tomatoes. Maybe you got birds to your tomatoes. Maybe you got groundhogs after your squash. Um, usually when we get, well, we have it on the fruit and the fruit is getting ripe, that's when we might gonna have some critter problems. So with the squirrels, if you have squirrel problems on your tomatoes, I highly recommend that rather than let the squirrel have your tomato when it's at its perfectly ripe stage, that you actually harvest that tomato a day or two before it needs to be harvested so that the groundhog or the squirrel doesn't get it before you. Um, well, we, it's very hard to exclude squirrels or birds. So you, can, you can try netting, you can, we can certainly try roll cover, um, but oftentimes those, you know, you've got this large tomato and you're trying to row cover it and the squirrel eventually figures out a way to get in there. So it can be, it can be a lesson in, uh, in uh, futility, um, but certainly, if they're destroying it enough, maybe be inspired to do it. But it's just something to keep in mind as your plant gets plant gets uh, gets taller and gets ready to fruit that some of these issues might come up. And then, what if your plant? What if your tomatoes are are like two foot tall now? <laughs> and you say, well, how in the heck do I plant these things in the ground? Um, are we going to dig a hole and and go to Middle Earth? Um, is we're going to do so I've laid out some some ways uh, here that we can uh, what is called trench planting uh, we're laying you know we're, we're digging digging a hole sort of a, uh, a hole and then it, we're making it shallow shallow because in essence what we're going to do is we're going to lay that tomato stem um, down in with its roots down in the hole and then shallower and then we're just gonna ever so gently uh, push that top of that plant above the soil. Um, and then we're going to put soil all over the root ball and all along that stem. Now along that stem, before we plant, we are gonna remove the leaves. So the tomato only needs two sets of leaves at the top. Um, and some people only do one. I guess it depends on your philosophy, but uh, if you look at the stem of your tomato plants and you see all the little hairs, you're, all those little hairs are potential um, roots. Um, when buried, the tomato will actually make roots, advantageous roots along that stem. And so if we have a, a leggy tomato plant, too tall, we don't want to dig a two foot hole to, to uh, put it in, then we're, we want to do trench planting. And it really is a better, a better system for leggy plants and it also increases the amount of roots that we have in a plant, a tomato strongly anchored into the soil. Um, there's lots of YouTube videos on trench planting, so um, just make a note on that and um, watch one of those videos. And then when it's time to transplant, uh, we wanna keep in mind that um, if you have grown the plants indoors, and you say, oh, today is my day to plant those tomatoes outdoors. Understand before you can do that, those tomatoes or those or peppers or eggplants, they need to be hardened off. And to harden them off, you've, kind of, you've got to get used to the outdoors in stages. And once again, if you Google trans, uh, hardening off, uh, there's some great instructional videos on how to get them hardened off. If you've bought them at, if you've bought your transplants at a uh, nursery or a big box store, um, most likely they are already hardened off and they're ready to go into your garden. Um, we're planting them on a cloudy or a less windy day. Uh, if it's windy and it's hot, that little plant is just going to succumb to being outdoors and being in a new environment. Um, and it may not do well, uh, and it may um, die actually. So we actually we want to plant any of our transplants, like our tomatoes and peppers and eggplants. We're going to plant them on a cloudy day, 
and we want to water them in and we want to install our, our uh, staking and caging and trellis at the same time. We also want to remove any blossoms that we have on the plants. I know it's hard for you to do that. Everybody's like, but no, that's a potential fruit. Yes, but what we want our plant to do when it first goes into the ground, we want our plant to grow up to be a big, strong plant. We don't want it putting out um, any uh, fruit right now. We want all of its energy going into growing up strong stems and good leaves and all things like that. So we want to take any blossoms off of a, a tomato transplant or a pepper transplant, we want to take them off when we plant them. And then once again, make sure we're washing our center, our, our centering on our tomatoes um, so that we can minimize the disease. And then lastly, label your plant. <laughs> uh, how many times I've gone out to my garden and said, I have no idea what that is. <laughs> I know it's a tomato, but I don't really know because I can't remember what I bought. So always make sure you label your plant uh, so that you know what you have growing in your garden. Now with cucumbers or squash, those are seeds. So, you know, those can go into the garden at any point. And then maintenance activities, just some basic maintenance. Uh, you know, again, weeding around the plant, um, keep your soil evenly moist, uh, and identify, if you start to see pest disease, identify what they are before you go to the big box store and start nabbing pesticides off the shelf. You know, know is it a good, is it a, a beneficial pest? Uh, there, there's beneficial pests that you may take for bad pests. Um, so know what is happening um, because that's the best way to manage it um, before you start applying your pesticides. And then fertilization, again, in, in our, with our summer vegetables, we, we don't need a lot of fertilization. We do need some. Um, if you're buying fertilizer from, from a store, make sure you're reading the label so you're not over fertilizing. But when we plant, our soil should be plenty fertile. And then when fruit is about the size of a golf ball, um, if it's an in-ground garden, you may want to side dress with another fertilization. Um, Container vegetables may need more uh, applications of fertiliz fertilizer. It just depends upon your, on your container mix. And then keep an eye on your plants. Uh, know what's happening with your plants. Know if they look stressed out. Know if there's pests on them. Know if it looks like they're getting disease. Um, and if you have a plant that's on the verge of death, it's just time to let it go. Let's pull it out of there. Let's get it out of there. So that's not infecting our other plants. And that uh, concludes my, uh, my talk for today. Uh, so uh, hopefully you learned something, uh, but uh, for those who have questions, I'll let Barb uh, bring those on. Okie dokie, we do have a few questions. Uh, one is about seeds from an heirloom plant. So are seeds saved from heirloom plants that are used the following year true heirloom anymore? Yes, they are. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, because it came from it came from a plant which has been listed as an heirloom. So I, I see where you're going with this. But if the plant itself, if the seeds itself, uh, the variety itself has been listed as an heirloom, then yes, it's considered that because it has the same traits as the original plant. It's just different seed. It has the same traits though. Has the same it's, name. That's does the same thing. Yeah. Okay, and another question is, what is a good companion plant flower for the beans? You talked about planting companion plants. For yes, uh, for beans, I like, I like marigolds uh, with the beans. But again, when we talk about companion plants, we don't want the companion plant too close to our, our vegetable crop. Because in many cases, we're using these companion uh, plants as uh, trap crops uh, to draw in uh, bad pests. They may want also draw in beneficial pests, but they're, they also have the potential to draw in bad pests. So um, in most instances, make sure our companion plants are at the perimeter or far enough away from our, our vegetable that if it's drawing in a, a bad pest, um, that bad pest isn't going to find our vegetable crop. But I like um, marigolds uh, for my beans. Um, nasturtiums are also good. 
Uh, another trick with if you have Mexican bean beetles or other pest issues with, uh, with bush beans is to grow your bush beans um, in between rows of potatoes. So if you have an in-ground garden and you've got potatoes, um, is to grow your bush beans in between those rows um, that you'll minimize some of your pest issues with beans. Great, thank you. Another question on row cover. So if you could give a better description on what row cover is and then what do you recommend? Floating fabric? So row cover is usually a spun polyester fabric. Um, row cover is just a sort of a generic term. Um, a lot of companies have their own branded uh, products. During the summertime, what we want to use um, in row cover is uh, summer weight fabric. So a lot of times in the, uh, in the big box stores around here, it'll say row cover, it'll say garden insect fabric, it might say frost blanket, um, but I think it's like a, a 10 by, like a 10 by 10 thing. Um, but what we're looking for in the summer garden is we wanna make sure that this fabric is summer weight, it's meant to be used on summer vegetables and is not a frost blanket. Um, Cause obviously if you put something too heavy on our summer vegetables, they would basically burn alive. Um, and there's different branded products. I'm just gonna take an example, like Johnny's um, Seed Company online, uh, they sell Agrabon. So Agrabon uh, with Johnny's, you have to buy it in huge, huge rows. There are other seed companies that probably sell it in smaller, uh, smaller offerings for the home uh, customer. Um, but I'm looking at Johnny's, they have three different weights, what they call weights. Um, and for summertime, I'm looking at at least uh, no more, no less than an 80% weight. A 70% weight would be too hot. An 80% or 90% is perfect, perfect for the summer garden and for insect um, control. Um, so it's a spun polyester fabric. It allows um, water uh, and it allows sunlight. And if I, when I say 80%, I mean it's allowing 80% of the sun's rays to come through that fabric. Uh, in the absence, I don't know, the fabric source seem to be out of everything, but uh, a lot of times we use wetting tool. Uh, we go into the fabric stores and get tool. Um, that works if you have a smaller garden, that works just as well. Um, to exclude insects, uh, smaller insects from, from our vegetables. Unfortunately, uh, row cover needs to be purchased online. Most of, uh, most of uh, row cover needs to be purchased online. Sometimes you can find it in the big box stores, but then again, you know, if you do, just make sure that it's not frost, it's not a frost blanket, um, but it's meant for um, use during the summertime. Summer weight, garden insect barrier. It, like I said, they have a lot of different names on it these days. Um, so just uh, read your label and know what you're getting. When you secure, one other thing, when you're securing the row cover, because you're going to have to secure it to the ground, um, consider how you're going to do that. A lot of people will use garden staples. Um, keep in mind that garden staples are going to put holes in your row cover. Um, and if it's not completely down, the wind makes the way. Uh, uh, a better solution might be rocks or lengths of rebar where you roll up the sides and lengths of rebar um, to keep your row cover secure over your plant. Now row cover is generally advised over the smaller plants because at some point the plants may outgrow the row cover um, once they get big enough and the hope is that once they are, are, are have grown big uh, that uh, the insects you know won't have such a detrimental effect on them. So you can also use it like that, put it on when they're small and then have to remove it for pollination or just because they've gotten too big. Okay, we have another question uh, regarding seaweed. <laughs> and seaweed? Seaweed, <laughs> yes. Just wondering if dried seaweed, the kind they sell as snacks, would help the garden because the seaweed is sold dried and with sea salt. Recognizing that that may be a silly question. Um, I would, it's not a silly question because I know where you get it from because a lot of the organic fertilizers have seaweed extract with them. Now, uh, something that you're using, that you're eating as a snack, um, I would not suggest uh, any kind of using it as any kind of fertilization 
on um, on a vegetable. And simply because we don't know what's what exactly is, is in the seaweed, how it was processed, what it was processed with. Um, surely if they took it out of the ocean and they just dried it off and threw some salt on, you'd say, well, probably, probably no harm there. Um, but so I would suggest uh, that if you're any about in organic circles, and certainly some of the fertilizers have seaweed, uh, seaweed extract in them, I would stick with something that is actually labeled um, for your vegetables um, and not necessarily your, your human snack. Um, I just think it's best practices to, to not do that because I don't know what it's going to do. <laughs> I agree. So can you talk real quick about uh, the best companion plants for uh, tomatoes and peppers? So for uh, tomatoes and peppers, uh, marigolds for peppers, definitely. I like marigolds with peppers, if only because um, they do, uh, with the peppers in their dark green leaves, uh, marigolds really make the peppers pop. Uh, for tomatoes, uh, everybody's favorite, the basil. Um, basil, uh, parsley, um, even a sweet alyssum uh, can be grown under tomatoes uh, to provide a good uh, nesting ground uh, for beneficial insects. Um, uh, I'm trying to think if you're a carrot grower, uh, sometimes uh, people grow carrots next to their tomatoes, although uh, as a companion, not necessarily to harvest. <laughs> uh, because if, you, if you're trying to harvest a carrot and it's right next to your, your tomato, guess what? You probably just destroyed your tomato roots. Um, so something may be in the carrot family and parsley certainly is. There's something in parsley family. I like parsley, basil, uh, marigolds at the end. I would keep the uh, zinnias, I'm trying to think, zinnias and something else because zinnias have a habit of drawing white flies. And so with zinnias, I love them as a companion, but later in the season, um, they draw in some white flies if there's white flies in your garden. So keep the, the zinnias at the perimeters of your garden. Um, and I'm sure there's some other things out there. I'm just not thinking of them at the moment. Um, but, uh, you know, Googling good companions for tomatoes may come up with some other ideas. But those are my favorites. Okay. So someone is a beekeeper and has a problem with stink bugs, like many of us do, on tomatoes <laughs> and squash bugs on cucumbers. Um, do you know of any organic pesticides to use that are safe for bees? You know what? When it comes to stink bugs and harlequin bugs and Mexican bean beetles, uh, as organic gardeners, we really have our work cut out for us because they're hard shelled. They have a hard shell, and organically, and even with conventional pesticides, it, it really is um, hard, especially in the in the adult stage, um, to do to do much with them or to get rid of them. And once they've been pested, you pretty much have to say, well, okay, they're infested, so we get to hand picking. Um, my best advice, I'm sure there are some pesticides that are labeled for it, um, and I haven't looked at my pest management guide um, this year to be able to give a specific recommendation. It might That might be a good question for our help desk um, later on, but um, certainly using uh, some things, cultural controls, like making sure that we're hand picking um, and we're scouting, we're getting the eggs underneath the leaf, we're uh, you know, using even if you don't want to touch the leaf, you can use duct tape and you can use duct tape to sort of uh, get rid of the eggs on the underside of the leaf. But daily um, hand picking, squishing the eggs, um, using roses when it comes to actually a pesticide. Um, I know most people are looking for something that's going to kill, and unfortunately. We just don't have pesticides in the organic spectrum, which, and maybe even the conventional, because I'm not sure what's out there as far as conventional and homeowner use, um, which will actually kill them. What we're trying to do is just manage them. Uh, in their young stage, they can be killed. Um, and it, once again, I need to, I need to uh, get more information on what will kill them um, before I gave um, specifics. But uh, uh, emailing our help desk. Uh, where somebody could do that research um, would probably give you the specific chemical that you're looking for. Right. 
So I have put the help desk email address up in the chat box for anyone who would like to uh, email okay. help desk. The last question is about keeping voles away. Um, do you <laughs> Yeah. Do you Pretty cat dollar stakes work? Um, there's it's a it's a common question. A lot of people have issues with voles, including myself. And I'll just have to be honest with you. The only thing that controlled them um, was that was an outdoor cat. Um, and uh, you know, voles uh, if if they're in the vegetable garden and they're a huge problem, uh, you're gonna have to invest some time and some money into you know, digging in some chicken wire underneath the ground in order to exclude them from the area that you wanna exclude them. Uh, voles will uh, wreak havoc with you know, things like uh, potatoes, um, uh, Irish potatoes and sweet potatoes, um, anything growing under the ground. Um, they're gonna snack on and, and they're gonna snack on good. Um, Short of getting an outdoor cat, um, the next best thing is, is to invest in some uh, chicken wire and um, dig it into the ground around your beds or grow those types of crops in a raised bed where you can more easily manage um, uh, installing chicken wire. Uh, that would be uh, my solution. I know that may not be the only solution, but uh, um, my experience tells me that that's, you know, those are some things that may help you out there. Okay. That is the last question that we have. Cool. Yes. So this All right. ends our, go ahead. You can. <laughs> yeah. So, um, so next week I'll be talking about container um, vegetables, containers specifically for the container, you know, some uh, uh, planting and some cultural controls over those uh, containers. Um, it's uh, several different uh, things that we need about when we're planting. Um, I do a lot of my vegetables in containers uh, now. Uh, I find it's, they're a little more easier to manage and plus I can move them around uh, so that they can get some sun. But uh, join me next week and I hope that uh, you learned something today. Great. Thank you, Denise. I am going to